I want to read from Judges chapter 6 and verse 11. And this is what it says. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat at the terebinth at Oprah, which belonged to Joash the Abizarite, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. If you look very carefully in this very simple, straightforward verse, you will actually find a flaw. Allow me to share with you what that flaw is. And this is what the flaw is, right? Gideon was beating out wheat in the wine press. And that is the flaw. The point is, you don't beat wheat in the wine press. You beat wheat at the threshing floor, right? You, you extract, um, you know, the juice from the grapes uh, to initiate the process of winemaking at the wine press. So beating wheat at the wine press, that is the flaw. And I want to speak to you a message and the message is titled wine press versus the threshing floor. The wine press versus the threshing floor. You see a wine press in those days was normally a large pit. You know, they would throw in all the grapes there and you know, they would squeeze the grapes to, to extract and initiate the process of making wine. But the, the, to thresh the wheat, it required a hard surface. And that's why exactly it's called a threshing floor. And normally the threshing floor would be located in a prominent place. You know, in, our, in today's terms, uh, you would expect uh, the, the, the threshing floor of those days to be at the city center. A prominent place. The wine press, not exactly. And you find that Gideon was, was threshing the wheat, you know, you know, in the wrong place, apparently, at, at the wine press and not the threshing floor. And the reason for that we also find in that particular verse, the reason for, for that was because he was hiding it from the Midianites. You see, the Midianites had caused several and serious damage. Several times they had caused serious damage in the past. And you, write, and you read about that in, um, you know, in Judges chapter 6, verses 3 to 6. Allow me to paraphrase it for you. Those verses say that the, the, the Midianites, the Amalekites, and the people of the East, they were so large in number, they, they were like the locusts, huge hordes. They would swoop down on the Israelites. Every time, you know, the Israelites would actually have a harvest or you know they would have their crops come these people as large as the locusts would come and just complete you know create complete damage their chaos there the bible says they would leave israel very low and that was the situation that uh, that that israel found itself and that's the reason why gideon was actually doing what he was supposed to be doing which is to thresh the wheat but at the wrong place you see, as a consequence of choosing the wine, the wine press or, or the pit to do what he was supposed to do, he wasn't getting full value for his effort. He wasn't getting full value for his effort. You know, although the wine press provided him, provided him the cover, the protection, if you may, it prevented him from him being all that he could be in the pit. You see, in a pit, right, there cannot be abundance, but there can only be sustenance. So, so you know, he was beating the wheat there in the wine press, in a pit. You, when you beat the wheat on a threshing floor, the hard floor, right, you get a better return for the effort. You know, you're able to separate the shaft from the wheat and you're getting a larger quantity, but in a pit, you don't get abundance you don't get the right kind of return for your effort. And many a times in life, you know, you and me also prefer the pit. You know, we prefer the pit instead of the prominent places that God has appointed for us. We believe that the pit is a place of safety for us. The pit provides us the cover. I prefer being in the background. I prefer being, you know, in, in a place where nobody can spot me. I, I, I don't want to be spotted. I want to be in that place. But you see, the problem with the pit is that you don't get the return as compared to the place 
that you, when you put your effort in, in the place that you're meant to be, and the effort that you put in the place that you're meant to be is going to give you a far higher yield as compared to the pit. You see, we validate our choice of location by saying, I've lost too much in the past. And I don't want to risk it any longer. I can't afford any further loss. So therefore, I prefer to be in the pit. In other words, we are actually saying, I prefer sustenance instead of abundance. I, as long as I get just little to get by, I'm fine with that. I don't want the abundance. I prefer the sustenance. And therefore, we choose to remain in the shadows and settle with not getting full value for the effort that we put in. That's the first principle that I pick up. The principle of, of choosing to remain in a pit, in choosing to remain in a place of obscurity instead of the God-appointed places that you need to actually be. For whatever valid reasons, you know, we kind of choose to settle instead of trying in choosing to move to the places, the God appointed places for us. The second principle that I want to draw your attention as I read this passage is found, is this, right? As a consequence of the past, Gideon was living the present in hiding and facing an uncertain future. As a consequence of the past, he chose to live the, the in the present in hiding and and he was prepared to face an uncertain future. I want to read those verses like I told you in, in Judges chapter 6, verses 3 to 6. For whenever the Israelites planted the crops, whenever, for whenever the Israelites planted the crops, the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. They would encamp against them, devour the produce of the land as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance, leave no sustenance in Israel. No sheep, no ox, no donkey. And they would come up with their livestock and their tents. They would come up like locusts in number. Both they and their camels could not be counted. They would lay waste the land as they came in. That was the situation. You see, the loss, the pain, the destruction of the past had left such a deep scar that Gideon chose to exist in the present in hiding. And he had no hope, he had no uh, expectations of what the future would hold for him. He lived in the moment. He said, as long as I got just a handful of wheat, as long as I got get just a handful of wheat, for the next meal, I'm good to go. I'm good to go. You see, a hard past, a miserable present, and a non-existent future. A hard past, a miserable present, and a non-existent future. And I'm thinking that this is not just the definition of um, Gideon's state of affairs, and probably it could be a definition of your state of affairs and my state of affairs, isn't it? The past has traumatized us, be it a loss, be it a failure, be it a disappointment. And the pain we, and we, the pain of the past, we, we somehow continue to be anchored to it. And we live in great fear, we live in great uh, disappointment in the present. And we, and we clearly have no expectations of a future. And our future seems distant, it seems helpless and it seems hopeless. You see, the principle here is living in the past will cause you to miss out on the opportunities of the present and certainly not prepare you to reach out for the things that God has set up for you in the future. And that's why we read in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 18 and 19, forget the former things. See, I'm doing a new thing. And I keep talking about this again and again. Because I believe there's a very strong connection between forgetting and seeing. Forget the former things. See, I'm doing a new thing. It's only when we choose to forget the former things, to forget the past, that you can see the new things that God is doing for you. You see, Joseph had to forget the, the pain of the past for him to adapt to the present. And because he was able to adapt well to the present, God set up the future for him. But often, you know, we, we have moved on in time. Time has moved on. 
but we have not moved on. Let me say that again. Time has moved on, but we have not moved on. We continue to be a prisoner of the past. You know, we need to let go of the past. However hard it is, however tough it is, however traumatic it is. We got to let go of the past. We got to move into the seasons that God has appointed for us. You know, I believe God is a God of seasons. But, you know, you can't leverage the things that God has prepared for us in the current season. If you continue to remain in the past. That's the second principle. The first principle was he was doing the right thing in the wrong place. He was threshing his wheat but in a pit. And therefore he wasn't getting full value of what was expected of him. And often you and me are like that. We're doing the right thing but you know in the wrong place. Not in the place that God's appointed for us. Second is he continued to live in the past. And he may have valid reasons for that. But I want to tell you, valid reasons often is the greatest stumbling block for you and me to receive the supernatural work of God. The third principle I want to draw your attention to is this. People and situation label us from the perspective of the past, but God identifies us from the perspective of the future. I want to say that again. People... And a situation label us from the perspective of the past, but God labels us from the perspective of the future. You see, in Judges chapter 6 and verse 12, this is what we read there. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, mighty man of valor. You see, that's an amazing thing. Gideon's minding his own business, he's, he's hiding himself under the uh, <clears throat> the cover of the, uh, you know, the, that, that wine press, the pit and, you know, nobody's expected to come there. Nobody's looking for you there. He's trying not to make a noise while he's beating that wheat on that, in the wine press. I mean, it's, it's pretty tough, right? I mean, you beat the wheat, it's going to make a lot of noise. It's like, the you know, in olden days, we used to, we used to see, um, you know, uh, ladies or whoever washing clothes. They would, they would beat the clothes on that stone. It would make so much of noise. Today, we've got washing machines, so we don't see all of that happen, right? But when you beat the wheat, right? It will make a noise. But, but here Gideon is trying to ensure that there's not too much of noise coming because he doesn't want to be spotted. He doesn't want to be identified. And the last thing he wants is company. But you know what? He's hiding. He doesn't want to be seen by anybody. You know, but God comes to him at his lowest point. God comes to him in his lowest point. Right? And that's so amazing for me. You know, when we think that nobody can see us, nobody can find us, you know, I'm at the lowest point and I choose to be here alone. But we have a God who chooses to visit us even in our lowest point of time. That for me is so mind-blowing. That is so amazing. The angel of the Lord appears to Gideon. And, and, and he says, he, you know, and it's amazing the way the angel of the Lord addresses him. But before we get there, the reason he was doing this was, the, was fear. He, he, he wanted to be alone. He didn't want the company because of fear. You know, um, and, and, and in his mindset, in his mind, as, he, as he's doing what he's doing alone in that wine press, and, and just before that angel comes, his mindset is, you know, I'm in it for sustenance. I'm not in it for abundance. As long as I get just a handful of wheat, that's fine. You know, I, that's all I'm here for. He says, his mindset is, I'm not going to amount to much. So let me just get that little wheat and let me just mind my, my whole life is about just, just getting that little wheat for the next meal. That is my life. That is my story. I'm not going to amount to much. In his mind, he's thinking, I'm, I'm, I'm weak. I cannot take on the challenges I face. I'm weak. I cannot take the challenges I face. He says, I'm here to get by. I'm just here to get by. I'm just so weak. I'm not going to amount to much. And Gideon was really framing his whole identity from this whole, from this whole thinking. 
I'm weak. I'm not going to amount to much. You know, I'm just here to get a little bit. I, I don't want. I don't want company. Nobody wants me. I don't want nobody. I, I. I want to. This is my future. This is my life. This little little thing. This being nobody is my identity. Like I told you a little while earlier, but but despite him having that that identity, you know, God chooses to visit him. And secondly, just notice how the angel of the Lord addresses him. Okay, and I find that so bewildering. I find that so, I mean, mind blowing. Despite him having a mindset like how I explained to you, the angel of the Lord addresses him this way and says, "The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor." <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. He says, "Who me? The Lord is the Lord. The Lord is with me." Right, I, I have a mindset that I'm not going to amount to to much. I, I have a mindset that I'm here just to get that little wheat that so I can just eat the next meal. And I'm I have a mindset that I don't want anybody's company, and I and I don't think anybody wants my company. I want to just be a Lord. I'm so filled with here, who me? The Lord is with me, a mighty man of valor. That's amazing, isn't it? You know and. and for me that is so 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 interesting because when i when i listen to those words it tells me so much it tells me that god is identifying gideon not from the perspective of the past but from the potential of the future god is not identifying gideon from the perspective of the past but from the potential of the future and that is so amazing because in life people label us people tell us you're not going to amount to too much people told me this when i was a kid that you're not going to amount to too much right you're not going nothing great is going to come out of you they they, they spoke in hushed whispers thinking that i wouldn't hear it as a kid when i was you know as i was completely messed up right they spoke in hushed whispers thinking that i'm not sometimes they told me on my face and for, for a long time i believed those labels and i had my own identity crisis and i thought you know that when i saw everybody else do well and i thought to myself nothing good is going to come of me, come out of me but i'm so glad that i worship a god who doesn't judge me or doesn't label me basis the my performance or doesn't label me with with my failures or doesn't label me with what people think but he identifies me from the potential of the future and he does the same thing with you so let me ask you this question Where are you in life right now? Are you like Gideon hiding in a pit of your choice? Not wanting company? I just want to be alone. I just want to get by. I I I feel so weak and and that's okay. My life's like this and you know I'm not thinking about the future. I I don't have a future. I have a non-existent. Let me just get by. Let me just be lonely. Let me just be miserable. But I want to tell you, you have a God who worships you at the lowest point of your life, and and He calls you, not by your past performance, but by your future potential. And He says, "Oh, child of mine, you are mighty. You're a person of might. You're a person of mighty valor. That is who you are." that is who you are you are a child who's called by my name and i'm going to call you for great exploits that is who you are god identifies us not by performance of the past but by the potential of the future i want to move on i want to move on to the next point the next point is this when i study this whole passage it says the title of the next point is this right go out from this pit and become a blessing to many go out from this pit from this wine press go out from here and become a blessing to many judges chapter 6 and verse 14 this is what we read and the lord said to him turn to him and said go in this might of yours and save israel from the hand of midian do i not send you go in the might of yours and save israel from the hand of the midians do not i send you you see god makes first makes gideon understand his identity oh mighty man of valor future potential not past performance and the second thing he commands him to go and save israel from the midianites and you see when i hear the word go the exact words are go in the might of yours and save israel from the hand of midian when i hear the word go 
and this is what I hear. Go, it's time to leave the wine press and, and occupy God appointed and ordained positions. And that position is a position of being a blessing to many. Go. When I hear the word go, it's about go. It's time to dismantle the sustenance mentality. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. Sustenance mentality. And it's time to entertain, entertain and accept an abundance mentality. Enough of just a little bit. Just a little bit. It's time to start embracing the abundance mentality. Pressed down, shaken together, running over. That kind of mentality. Exceedingly, abundantly, more than you can ask and think of. That kind of mentality. Not that little bit mentality. Not that konjam mentality. Right? Go. It's time to change your uh, identity from being fearful to being mighty. You've lived in fear for too long. It's time to, to discard the lie of the devil of being, I'm afraid, I'm fearful of this, I'm fearful of that. It's time for you to go and embrace the mentality of, of being mighty. Being mighty because you serve a mighty God. Go. It's time to use the strength that God has equipped, empowered and anointed you with. Go. It's time for you to, you know, to use the strength that God has equipped, empowered and anointed you with. You see, the choice is between staying in the wine press and barely getting by or going because the you know according to the word of god to become all that god has appointed you and me to be and that's a pretty straightforward simple choice isn't it you can choose to stay back in the wine press and just get by a little bit little bit live in fear live in constant tension and stress and say okay this is a little bit or you can choose to go because the lord says go i'm sending you go in your strength i am sending you go and become all that god has empowered, ordained, appointed and designed you and me to be. I want to move on. The next principle I learned from this passage is, our background doesn't matter. What matters is the presence of the Lord that accompanies us. Our background doesn't matter. What matters is the presence of the Lord accompanying us. You see in Judges chapter 6 verse 15 and 16, we read this. And he said to him, you know, I mean, the, the angel of the Lord has given the instruction and says, go and save Israel, you know, um, you know, from the Midianites. And, 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 and Gideon hears these words, he's, he's shell-shocked and he's, he's speaking from a space of honesty. He's speaking from a space of logical reasoning. And this is what he says in Judges chapter 6, verse 15 and 16. And he said, please Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh. And I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, But I will be with you, and you shall strike, strike Midianites as one man. You see, the task that God called Gideon for was massive. It seemed impossible and improbable. And frankly, when God calls you for, and me for an assignment, it will always seem massive. It will always seem impossible and, pro and improbable. And if you are facing and you are standing before a task that seems uh, impossible and improbable, I want to tell you that it's got God written all over it. <laughs> it's got God written all over it. You know, as we read a little while earlier, that the Midianites, the Amalekites, the people of the East were, were compared to, they look like the locust. Your locust doesn't come as one locust. It comes like a swarm of locusts devouring anything in its path in terms of crops and God is saying I, I'm asking you to go you know so when I think of that you know the it seemed that uh, it seemed that uh, what uh, Gideon was saying was pretty reasonable isn't it and he and he goes on to uh, qualify his uh, reasons and his and his qualification of his reasons was you know my clan is the weakest among all the tribes my tribe is the weakest my clan is the weakest in that clan my family is the weakest in that family I am the weakest then etc 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 pretty reasonable answers he wasn't exaggerating 
he was probably telling the truth right from a logical standpoint and 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 then therefore the task seemed all the more amplified and it seemed the difficulty seemed all the more um, you know accentuated and god doesn't respond to gideon by you know the normal objection handling techniques which you heard in, here in sales he didn't look to gideon and say no 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 don't worry your family actually is not the weakest you know there's another family which is weaker than yours he didn't say your your clan is not the weakest there's another clan he didn't say all that right he his only response to the perfectly logical answers of gideon was just one phrase and the phrase actually contains if i'm not mistaken five words or six words six words and the six words are but i will be with you but i will be with you he didn't respond and say your family is not the weakest your clan is not the weakest your tribe his only response to all the you know the reasonable justification of why gideon says i can't go was only one one sentence six words but i will be with you but i will be with you and let me ask you this question what has god called you to do what's the dream that god's placed in your heart you know your background frankly doesn't matter your reasons may be real but what really matters is the presence of god with you your background doesn't matter your reasons may be real but what really matters is the presence of god with you and interestingly i want to just tell you this right look at what the verse says and you shall strike the midianites you shall strike the midianites it's not it's not that you may strike or you 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 have a good probability of striking you shall strike which means it's already done in the spiritual realms it's not it's already happened it's already sanctioned it's already finished in the spiritual realms right it's all you shall strike whenever god says you shall strike you shall inherit you shall take you shall it means it's done it's done it's done i'm reminded of the words that uh, you know the um, uh, god tells moses and he sends tell the send those spies right go and check out the land that i have given you go and check out the land that i have given you i'm paraphrasing it my own translation this is right go go and check out the land that i have given you their their point and therefore moses sends these 12 spies their job was just to go check the land and not their job was not to come back and talk about the probability of taking the land or not because the land had already been given they were their chance was just to go and check it out but but they looked at probability also they come they come back and say yeah the land is flowing with milk and honey 10 of them right but you know there are giants there we look like grasshoppers in their eyes we can't but you know what god had already pre qualified and said i've already given you that land joshua and caleb understood that so what's the dream that god's given you what's the task that god's given you right is it seeming so large and seeming so improbable that you say hey i i don't think i can't i don't have the strength i don't have the acumen i don't have the education i don't have the expertise i don't have the grasping power i don't have influence i don't have this god says hey forget about all of that i am with you and i've given it to you already i am with you and i have already given it to you into your hand so it hadn't happened physically yet but god tells and he mentions it like it's already completed what matters for us to inherit that promise of god for us to inherit that dream for us to inherit that blessing are two factors and factor number 1 is the factor of obedience radical obedience right and second is the presence of god you can look at it in any order it can be i would think the presence of god is 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 the most important thing and second is the is obedience you need both in equal measure that's why moses looking to god says lord unless your presence goes with us we will not move and god says my presence will go with you. moses understood this whole principle of god's presence and you know we need to we need to ensure 
that we have God's presence wherever we go. You know, I, I don't know about you, but, but the first thing that I check when I go out anywhere, why even within the house is, where is my mobile phone? Right? Because I, I need to have my mobile phone around me. And I, know, and I know it's not a great habit, but that's, that's who I am. But more than wanting the mobile phone, right? we need to check, am I in the presence of God right now? Am I in the place of God, surrounded by God's presence? Moses realized that. He says, Lord, your presence, your presence. Without your presence, we will not go. And God seemed to be telling Gideon, don't worry about the size of the enemy. I'm with you. I am with you. And as you read the conclusion of this, uh, this story, you find that I think with 300 odd people, he manages to beat, uh, you know, I mean, he defeat the Midianites who were, who were you know, if I'm not mistaken, some 30,000 odd, some number like that, 300 versus 30,000 odd, right? Because, you know why? Not because they were great warriors, not because they were great skilled, uh, you know, in using weaponry. You know, in fact, they didn't use any weapons. The reason that they were able to overcome was the presence of God and the radical obedience. So I want to encourage you, right? Where are you in your life right now? Don't let the excuses of the enormity of the task prevent you from claiming that which God has ordained for you. Don't let the excuses of the enormity of the task prevent you from inheriting that which God has appointed and ordained for you, which he's already given to you. So let me conclude this. As I conclude this, I want to share the following with you. Don't let the past hold you hostage, however traumatizing the past is, however difficult the past is. God's changed the seasons and you need to move into the season with the right kind of mindset. The second thing is, God identifies you from the perspective of the future, from the perspective of potential, not from performance, not uh, or performance of the past or, or a track record of the past or labels that people have placed on you. And that is so reassuring. The third thing is, it's time for you to go, move away from the place of hiding and to go to become a blessing to many. You can't stay in the, you know, very often, you know, we quote this verse and says, I know, uh, you know, God has got great plans for me. Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the thoughts that I have, you thoughts of peace, not of evil, of future and hope. We make great paintings of that verse. We make beautiful pictures and we pull it up. Right? Nothing wrong with that. But if you're putting up those pictures in the pit and saying great future and you choose to remain there, you know, I think your chances of that is pretty remote. You need to go from the pit. You need to move away from those places and move into the places where God has appointed, ordained for you. So it's only there that you'll become a blessing to many. And finally, I want to tell you this. Our background doesn't matter. Our excuses don't matter. What matters is the presence of God and our willingness, you know, to radically obey whatever he tells us. So friends, I want to just close this by saying wilderness versus threshing floor. Staying in the past, staying in fear versus moving into the future, moving into the spaces and places that God has ordained for you and to become all that you are meant to be. God bless you and I pray that this word would have encouraged you.